This weekend begins our Holy Week. It is a time of prayer, a time for us to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is good that we, that we meditate on the sacred scriptures that the church has chosen for us. And I would invite us to reflect a little bit more in the next couple days on this passion by St. Luke before we enter into the Word of God for the days coming for the, Easter, for the Holy Triduum and, and for Easter. And, and today I would like us to, to reflect, I uh, just want to offer um, some of the unique qualities of Luke's gospel as we meditate on this passage um, for your meditation. It begins with the first gospel proclaimed by Deacon Josh at the back of the church. And what's unique to Luke's gospel um, is on a number of levels what is implicit in Matthew and Mark, what we have in the A and the B cycle, Luke makes clear in this C cycle. For example, the disciples were cheering, they were praising God and they were saying, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. In Luke's gospel, he has it say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what Matthew and Mark meant that is the Messiah coming. It comes from sacred scripture. But Luke wants his Gentile audience not to miss the prophecy being fulfilled. That is very evident in Luke's gospel. It is only in Luke's gospel that the Pharisees come to Jesus and ask him to rebuke his disciples because by yelling this out, by proclaiming that the king is coming, they're going to rile up the city and get everyone into trouble. And Jesus says, even if the disciples were silent, the stones would cry out. Now this too is a prophecy, Jesus gives us. It is in the writing, uh, the lives of the prophet, uh, a piece of literature that goes back to the first century, um, a Jewish piece of literature that believes and proclaims that it was Jonah the prophet who said that at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, the stones would cry out. And this fulfills Jesus' prophecy. With the coming of the new covenant, the old order would pass away. The temple would be destroyed. Not one stone left upon another stone. And we know that Jesus means this in this passage because the very next verse after the gospel that Deacon Josh proclaimed has Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem because of their lack of faith, the persecution and the difficulty of that persecution because of their lack of faith, their inability to let go and to embrace the new covenant. And then we go into the passion according to Luke. And in the passion, we have a very unique dialogue between Jesus and his disciples. Jesus speaks of them sitting on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he goes on with a very unique prayer for St. Peter. It should be noted that at the first Vatican Council where the church fathers spoke about the infallibility of the Pope, they refer not back to Matthew chapter 16, a passage that comes to mind for all of us when we think of papal infallibility. That passage in Matthew 16 is that Jesus calls Simon Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the keys of the kingdom will be given to you and what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We often see this as tied in with infallibility but at First Vatican Council they go back and they quote Luke chapter 22 where Jesus is praying for the fidelity of Peter that he remains strong in faith for his brother. This is at the heart of papal infallibility. And we should also pray as Jesus does for our current Holy Father, Pope Francis, that he remain faithful to the teachings handed on to him. And then we have a very unusual passage. They start talking about swords. This is from the one who teaches us to turn the other cheek. Does Jesus want a revolution to start? A, a military coup? Is he, is he proclaiming liberation theology here? No. Jesus is very clear. This is about the scriptures. And while our first reading today is Isaiah chapter 15, the passage about the prophecy of the suffering servant, the passage that Jesus is referring to is also in Isaiah. Isaiah 53 
in which we're told that the suffering servant would be counted among criminals. And it's criminals that are rising up, causing rebellion. It is criminals that carry short swords and were killing the, the Roman soldiers. It is people like Barabbas, the zealots, who are criminals. But Jesus is very careful that he wants to observe all of the prophecies of old and people will see his disciples and talk about them oh they had swords on them they struck the high priest's servant's ear of course we know Jesus heals that ear but it's all to fulfill the prophecies of old and then we have Jesus going to the garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives it is here only in Luke that we hear about an angel ministering to Jesus May angels not only messengers, but they are also guardians, comforters. And the angel comes to Jesus to comfort him in his humanity. It is here that he, he sweats drops of blood. And while physicians will tell us that we can be in so much agony that blood can actually come through our skin, the Jewish people would have heard this as a fulfillment of prophecy. A fulfillment of the old covenant into the new. It would refer back to, the, to Adam. That Jesus is the new Adam. And just as God had told Adam that he would bring forth bread from the earth by the sweat of his brow. So Jesus is going to bring the new bread. The true manna that comes down from heaven. His body and blood, soul and divinity through his sweat. Through his labor of passion. A bloody passion that brings forth our salvation. This is taking place on the Mount of Olives. It is believed by the Jewish people that the tree of life at the center of the Garden of Eden was an olive tree. As a matter of fact, they have a tradition that at the end of Adam's life, he sends his wife Eve and his son Seth back to the Garden of Eden to ask the guardian angel protecting, blocking the gates to the Garden of Eden, if he would go back to the Tree of Life and get some of this oil that would bring comfort to Adam as he was preparing to die. It makes sense that the church on Holy Thursday, when these events are taking place in the Garden after the Last Supper, that we would bring the oils of the church into the church oils that are blessed by the bishop, but off ultimately find their salvific, pers their salvific pers purpose through the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as on the Garden of Gethsemane, the word Gethsemane means oil press, the passion begins here as the oil is squeezed down and gives life. So Jesus' passion has begun. It is only in Luke's Gospel that as he proceeds on the way to the cross, that he comes across these women lamenting. And he tells them to pray for themselves and their children. Again, even in the midst of his agony, he's concerned about how we are going to embrace the new covenant and the persecution that we will face. It is only in Luke's gospel that we hear the words of Jesus, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Words that we hear not only for the executioner, those crucifying Christ, but we hear being offered as a healing balm to all of humanity seeking the forgiveness of their sins. It is only in Luke's gospel that we have this very unique exchange between Jesus and the criminals. One of them rebuking and mocking Jesus. The other coming to Jesus' defense and in humility asking the Lord to remember him when he enters into his kingdom. And what are Jesus' words? Amen, I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. A word that is rarely used in sacred scripture. Most notably, it is mentioned in the book of Genesis, again, about the story of Adam and Eve. Because the word paradise itself, the Greek word, means garden. And Jesus is the new Adam who reverses the effects of that first fall. And it is with his passion that the gates of paradise are opened and he will go into paradise leading this criminal with him.
It is in Luke's gospel that we have different last words from our Lord Jesus Christ. The words that we hear in Matthew and Mark, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are from Psalm 22. Words that we heard in our responsorial psalm today attributed to the suffering servants. But in Luke's gospel, we have the additional words, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Psalm 31. So Jesus takes the cross and makes it a, a place of prayer as he offers his, sal his sacrifice for our salvation. It are these mysteries that we are entering into and that we meditate on as we approach Easter. Let us walk with him. Let us remain faithful to him. Let us experience in him the salvation he has won for us.